Hi, Foundry Builders. Uh, this is Logan, excited to be back with you on the Palantir Developers channel to kick off a new series uh, called Foundry Developer Desk Sides. Uh, in this series, we're going to try out a different format. We're going to go really long form and uh, almost streaming style, let you follow along as a, a Palantir engineer builds out some portion of a project or a project end to end on top of Foundry. I'm going to kick things off with an example of building a ticket management system using the tools of the object layer. So object types and link types and actions uh, to put together a Kanban board where we can create tickets and move them through a life cycle, add comments, add files, uh, and look at the bare bones of how we put together a operational action driven application on top of Foundry. With that said, let's go ahead and dive right into building. Okay, so this is future Logan here to give you a sneak peek of what we're actually building towards in this developer desk side. It turns out that myriad operational workflows break down into some kind of ticketing system. We have a thing that needs to be done out in the world. It needs to be assigned to somebody. It needs to have a status and it has some context. Uh, maybe you need to have a conversation about what's going on related to that ticket. And that ticket may conceptually be an alert that somebody needs to triage and then action, or it may be an optimization that needs to be carried out uh, on a piece of equipment or an assembly line. Um, it could be an invoice uh, that needs to be filled or uh, in some other way actioned. But fundamentally, we have this idea of a ticket and we need to be able to work with these within Foundry, assign them around, and have different things going on. In one common view, there's a bunch of different ways. You might have an inbox for your tickets. Uh, you might have a, a kind of uh, digital twin of a, of a real world you know, uh, location and look at your tickets on top of that. But here we've got a Kanban where we can see tickets in different statuses. Uh, I, can, I can choose one of my tickets and update it, you know, change the description or the assignee, move it to a different status. Uh, I can also view all of the details where I could have, for example, you know, this comment history, um, you know, tracking along, keeping track of, you know, who's writing comments and uh, what they're saying, what the, the history of, of this ticket is. Uh, and again, this is just a super trivial, uh, a super um, quick to put together version. You're going to see, I'm just going to go through pedantically like click by click. Uh, you can follow along as I build this. We'll talk about everything that goes into it, uh, all the different parts of Foundry that we're going to use. Um, but this again, just to give you an idea where we're heading to, and I'll kick it back over to Pass Logan to pick up with the project description and solution design, and then dive into getting this thing built. So hopefully future Logan just gave you a nice run through of what this Kanban ticket management workflow looks like when it's finished. Now let's rewind the clock and dive in to see how we actually put together all the different pieces of Foundry that are at play in a solution like this. So whenever I start a new use case, I put together a bit of documentation about it. Uh, generally, it's a use case overview and then a solution design. And here I've just put this together in a notepad document inside of Foundry. A lot goes into this, right? Lots of descriptions and, and narrowing down on the, the functional requirements, what this thing needs to do. And then we take all that stuff and we go through this solution design process to think about what our pipeline needs to look like and what our object model, you know, what our, our ontology data structure should look like, what the life cycle of our different elements is going to be, you know, to think about the actions that we're going to need to configure um, all the way through to some sketches of what our interfaces might look like. Now, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time diving into the one I did here. And if you're interested in understanding this solution design process, we actually have laid it out in our new publicly facing Foundry documentation. You can find it at palantir.com in the platform overview and use case lifecycle section, where we go through a description of this kind of process of how do I how do I go through and write up the overview of what I want to accomplish and then 
turn that into the set of components that I'm then going to build on top of the platform. Since I want to focus in this developer desk side on the actual building part and not the kind of theory of use case design, I'm going to dive right in. We'll just make a few notes on what we're actually going to do today. So here we're going to build a uh, ticket management system. Um, we've got a couple of things that this needs to do, uh, and we've got a couple of uh, you know pieces or components that we need to put together. So we need a, uh, a ticket object type, and we need a comment object type because we want people to leave comments on top of the tickets. Um, we have multiple comments per ticket, so it makes sense for those to be separate object types. Um, we want to keep track of a couple of things. We need, a, obviously, some kind of ID for each of these. Uh, we need the assignee and the status and the description. Uh, and I want to show you guys how we can also work with some uh, file attachments, um, a pretty straightforward way. So these are some things that we'll need on our tickets. And then our comments, we'll need to know a, a comment ID. Um, we'll need to know about the um, the the commenter, the person who left it. Uh, we'll need a timestamp for when that comment was made. Uh, we'll obviously need the comment text, um, and we'll we'll say that's good for our very simple comment. Um, so then. What else, what do we need to actually do with these? Uh, well, our ticket, we need to be able to, so our actions, we need to be able to create a new ticket. Um, we need to be able to uh, assign and update the status of a ticket. And uh, we need to be able to leave a comment. Those are kind of the most bare bones uh, things that we need to do in our workflow. Um, then, so we have something to look at. Uh, we'll need a uh, ticket object view, and this can have a lot of our actions embedded in it, as well as the comment history and everything like that. And then we want to put together a Kanban kind of like overview uh, application, so a standalone app. Okay, uh, and then you know our order of operations, what do we actually need to build to accomplish those things? So we need, um, a schema data set. So every object type that we want to create, even if we're creating an empty object type, we need a uh, backing data set. So we're going to look at how do we create uh, schema data sets for empty object types. Um, then we're going to configure our object types properties, link types, and actions. So these are all things that we'll do in the ontology management tool. Uh, we'll we'll build all those pieces. Then we'll um, grab the object view editor and the workshop interface builder, and we'll build uh, the ticket object view. And then finally, we'll wrap things up with this Kanban um, workshop application. Okay, so this is where we're going uh, over the next 45 minutes or an hour. Let's see how far we get. We'll start here with uh, schema data sets for our empty object types. And there's a couple of different ways that we could do this. Um, I always actually forget the specific um, language, but our two options, basically, we can do a quick and dirty uh, approach using Fusion. So Fusion is the, the kind of spreadsheet editor, and it has a feature where you can select a region of a spreadsheet that you've built and sync it out to a data set. So that's a pretty quick way. You can define some columns, you can put in some sample data, you can set the column types. That's the most important thing for these schema data sets is that the columns of the backing data set have the appropriate types. Uh, and you can do all that in Fusion. But if you're gonna build a production application, a production workflow, um, the quote unquote right way to do this is with a code repository. And we actually have here in the docs um, a little sample code in uh, this area. Create an empty data set for ontology right back. That's what we want to do. Here's our sample PySpark. I can come into my you know folder, create a new code repository, and drop this in. While this initializes, we're just going to call this <coughs> our um, 
object schema source and initialize a Python repository. We've got some handy helpers here on our welcome page. Create a new Python transform. This is gonna create a new file in the right place. So we're gonna call this our ticket schema.py. We'll start there. And we can see over here, I've now got this ticket schema.py file in the right location within my repository structure. I'm just gonna delete all of that and paste in what I got from the documentation. And you can see the immediate thing that I need to fix is this output location, right? I need to, to actually define where the output data set should be and what it's called. And a couple of different ways I could grab that path, but I'm just gonna hop back over to the ticket framework folder, make a new subfolder for my object schema data sets. And then here in the metadata sidebar, I can copy quickly the full path to this location and then paste it in here as the target output. And then I just need to make sure I add the data set name uh, here at the end. So this is the name of the new data set that will be created. We'll just call it ticket schema. Now here within the body of my transform definition, I, you can see we're, we're defining this schema structure and then we're going to use the Spark session context to create a new data frame and that's what we'll actually return to turn into this output data set. I'm gonna tidy this up. We're just gonna call this tickets instead of proposals. And then here within our schema, let's, let's look at what we wanna capture. So creation time is a timestamp, looks good. Created by is a string, looks good. Um, we need a couple of things, we need a, a ticket title as a string. Um, every object type has to have a title. Similarly, we need a ticket ID as a string. Those are the two required properties for every object type. Um, priority looks good. We can keep a priority status uh, or a priority for each one. Um, we also wanna have a status that's a string and we need to have the ticket description, which is gonna be some free text still fundamentally a string type. And then lastly, we wanna have our attachments. And in this simple model, we're gonna just allow multiple attachments directly on the ticket object. There's some other patterns we'll talk about later on, give you more flexibility, um, but this is kind of the simplest thing. To allow multiple attachments, we're gonna make this an array type uh, of strings. So there we go, this is how we can kind of define an array and then um, define the type of uh, that array. So this is an array type of string type. We can check, make sure that this kind of does what we want just by previewing our output. Great, and so here in our preview, we can see we now have all of these column types and the appropriate uh, data type associated with them, you know, arrays, strings, integers, timestamps, and that looks good to me. So we'll go ahead and kick off a build on this data set. And then while that's running, um, we'll duplicate this ticket schema to create our comment schema i got to change a couple of things. We obviously need to change the output data set. So this is now our comment schema. And then here within our transforms, uh, within our transform definition, we'll keep created time and created by. We'll get rid of the title. We'll leave the ticket ID because we want each comment to have a foreign key to the appropriate ticket. We don't need an idea of priority or status for our comments. Uh, we want the comment text as a string. Um, and that's 
probably all we need for the, the very simplest version of this. So we'll build this output data set. And I'm realizing uh, as I built this one that over here in the ticket schema, I did everything I wanted, except I forgot to add an assignee. So we also need a string field for the assignee. Um, and I can go ahead and make a new commit for this change and kick off another build. Okay, now we have both of our schema data sets built. We can see our build finished up. Our ticket schema has all of the columns that we'd like it to, and we can hop into object, uh, the ontology management tool to start configuring these object types. So an easy way to do this, there are a bunch of different ways. We could go straight to OMA. Here, we'll just go view the data set in question, which we can jump to from our build helper inside code repositories. And then under actions, we can create an object type. This brings us directly into ontology management app with our wizard um, open to create a new object type. We wanna call these tickets. Um, we'll give these maybe a tick mark icon in anticipation of us doing a good job closing them out. We wanna map all of the columns as properties and specifically give the ticket title column the title key and the ticket ID the primary key. Okay, so that lands us straight into our new object type overview page. We can see our properties have been automatically mapped. We don't have any action types yet. We don't have any link types yet. So let's now do the same thing for our comment object type, and then we'll create a link between those and start setting up our actions. Instead of going all the way back to the data set or our repository, we can just come to the home page of the ontology management app and then choose to create a new, uh, a new object type, and this time select the backing data source from our recent files. So we can grab our comment schema. This is gonna take us just into the same place. We've got a nice icon for comments. The title key is just going to be the comment ID, which I now realize I forgot to create. We can hop back in create a new comment ID in our backing data set. Go ahead and kick off a build here and we'll be right back to map that to our object type. Okay, now we have the comment schema data set updated with a comment ID column as well as the ticket ID column. So we can come back to our comment mapping, um, update the backing data source. Now we'll just refresh this and now have the comment ID. We'll use the comment ID as both the title key and the primary key because we're not planning on showing an individual comment standing alone. It'll always be in the context of an existing ticket. So we're never going to see this title key or at least we're never planning on displaying it. Um, we'll see how that works later on when we're building the object view. So now we've got our comment object type and we can go in and create our link between the comment and our ticket. So we'll create a new link type, comment, bring up our ticket that we just created. You can see if we're going in this direction, we have the mini side by default on the left and the one side on the right. We can change these cardinalities around and for example, flip it over so that the ticket had the primary key of the foreign key and uh, we were going to the primary key of the comment, but that, that doesn't make sense in our case. In our case, our comment holds the foreign key. It holds a ticket ID that will match up with the ticket ID primary key on the ticket object type. 
If we wanted to have even more flexibility, we could define a many to many relationship. So you could have one comment that was associated with many different tickets, and you could have one ticket that had many different comments. Uh, and if we wanted to do that, we would need a mapping table. We would need a data set with two columns that every row is the pair of primary keys that defines the relationship between one comment and one ticket. And then we could have as many rows as we needed defining all of the different links, all the different relations between individual comments and individual tickets. Um, in our case, we, we're going to keep it simple. We'll just have uh, the comment and a foreign key on each comment to the ticket. And then we'll, we'll see how we set that up as we go in the um, uh, in the process of building out the actions to add a comment. Okay, which, uh, which we'll hop over and start with now. We've got our two objects and we have them linked together. Um, we can return to the, uh, the main ticket object and start adding in our actions. Actually, there's one, there's one thing we need to do here, uh, a few things we need to do before we create our actions. We need to do a little bit of cleanup on our properties. Um, so if we come into the property editor view, we can go through and each of these, we're just going to do um, some extra metadata configuration uh, that tells us how to render these properties, um, what subtypes they are, um, maybe change some of the indexing. Um, so we're going to look at these things that we can change over here for each property. So for example, the creation time is a timestamp. Uh, we want to turn on date and time formatting and choose a short version of this, right? We want to show this with the uh, comment, you know, uh, history or, or when this, you know, created time, if we're going to display this, um, we want to have a nice display. Same thing here for the created by, uh, we're going to turn on the value formatting and let the ontology know this property is going to hold a multi-pass username. So when we do the creation, when we want to track, you know, what user created this or who's this assigned to, um, we want to turn these on because we're going to store a multi-pass username, but with this value formatting on, Foundry knows to render a rich component that's going to show the user's full name and give you access to their email and see their public user profile uh, within Foundry. Um, and that's going to help in workflows where you know, organizations have people that have the same names. You need to show something a little bit more than just first name, last name, um, and no one wants to use, you know, user IDs. So this is a really nice way of keeping track of individual users. We'll see how that looks in just a little bit. Um, title, ID are fine. Priority is fine. Status, we don't want to do anything with status. Uh, it's just a regular short string. Description over here, we're going to change our render hints for the description because um, we want to indicate that this is going to be long text. And to indicate that it's long text, we need to turn off the selectable, sortable, and low cardinality render hints. Um, and this is going to default to, you know, uh, you know, showing the entire long string. It's also going to save us if we were indexing incoming data. You know, if we had like a, a document or an email or something like that, and we were indexing that, um, this is going to save us some storage space in the indexed storage um, because we're not going to, you know, uh, uh, do these extra indexes um, and we're just going to keep the long text. On the attachment side, this one's kind of interesting because we're actually going to change the property type. And down here at the bottom, we have an attachment property type. You have to have a string source to be able to choose the attachment type. Um, but once we do, uh, when we go into our actions, we'll see um, a form element that will allow users to drop a file and store it in this attachment. Um, and under the hood, that, that file will get stored in an appropriate file storage backend, and um, we'll just kind of keep a pointer to it here. But by telling the ontology that this property type is going to be an attachment, all of the rendering and, and kind of um, storage is going to be taken care of for us. Again, we'll, we'll see that here in just a second. Okay, um, and let's go ahead and do that quickly for the comment as well while we're doing properties. Um, so we'll set the creation time, date, and formatting to uh, short. We can also set it, maybe we'll set this one to relative to now. This is nice. This is nice for um, 
things that are happening quickly. Uh, you know, for the with like within the last week or so, it'll give you you know kind of a human readable creation time, um, a human readable uh, value here. So when we're looking kind of at the comment history, you know, it will say a few seconds ago, three hours ago, and then once you're a few days back, it'll start just giving the short date and time. Um, so that can be nice. We'll we'll try that one out. Created by again, we want this one to be uh, multi pass. Um, and then the comment text, we want to be a long text as well. Okay, now, now we're ready to go to our ticket and set up some of our actions. So we needed three. We need a, a create ticket, we need an update assignee and status, and we need a add comment. So we'll get started with the create ticket action type. This is a change object. So what we have here is just a little wizard that's going to take us through the action creation. Um, this is just going to set the starting point. We're going to be able to change all this later on. But this is to add a new ticket. <laughs> Literally always forget this. Um, okay, we can't add them yet because we haven't made these editable. So to make our object types editable, we need to go to the data sources tab for each one and generate the right back data set. So the way that the ontology layer in Foundry works is you have an input data set, you have the object type, and then as you accumulate edits on that object type, you can write them back to an output data set. The output data set isn't where the edits are stored in real time. You know, the, the actual source of truth for all the edits is within the index storage at the ontology layer, but you have to have this materialization destination. You have to have this output data set um, and this is what kind of sets the whole um, process up. It's also how you can control some of the permissions. There are a couple of different layers of permissions that govern who can make edits. Uh, and one of them is the permissions associated with the output data set, with this write back data set. So we're just going to drop this into the same uh, object ticket schema folder where we're storing these. We need to do this for the ticket and then also for the comment. And we'll put them there. Okay, automatically edited, automatically created. Great, and so now if we hop back to the ticket overview and create the create ticket action to change, we'll be able to choose our ticket type and all of the properties that we want to have as part of this action, right? So everything, we wanna let the user set everything on a new one uh, as they go. We can also see over here by default, it's just um, saying I am, you know, this external dev relations user account, that's the available user who can run this action. What you'd wanna do in a real world is set this to an appropriate group of users, right? You, you have a user group for your you know, workspace or this this project or this application um, or a segment of your organization, you wanna set this to the group of users that are going to be able to take this action. All right, a couple of things to do just in terms of housekeeping. Uh, we wanna give this an API name in case we wanna call it through the Foundry Gateway API if we wanna call this externally. Um, we're not gonna to need to do that obviously here, um, but nice to have something other than the generated name. Within the rules section, okay, this is the summary of what this actually does. What is this action going to do? It's gonna create a ticket object and it's gonna set all of these properties. And by default, each one of the properties is going to be set to a parameter within this automatically generated form. So right now we have one form parameter for every property on this object. But a couple of these we don't actually need a form parameter for. So for example, creation time, rather than getting it from a parameter, we just wanna set it to the current time. And the same thing for created by. We just wanna set this to the current user, right? And all of the rest of these we do want to get from the form. The ticket ID is a little bit of a special case. We'll look at that in just a second. Um, but the rest of these, you know, we, we want um, these values to come from the, the form itself. So when we come over to the form, we can now remove the creation time and the created by parameters, uh, inputs that were created. We can also get rid of this unused ticket. Uh, this will be created anytime you 
start an action from the overview page of the uh, object type. So when we're in that object type overview and we click create new action, we'll, we'll get this parameter by default. Uh, we're not gonna use it here. We'll use it later in the edit action though for the changing of the assignee and the status. Okay, so now we just have the ones that need to come from the form itself. Like I said, ticket ID is a special case. We have a bit of magic incantation to do by adding a type class actions generate underscore UUID. And we can see this results in a universally unique identifier being created uh, within our form. We can come back over and then simply turn off this element's visibility. This means that the form, when the form is loaded, is gonna generate a UUID for our new ticket. And that takes care of um, how we you know, make sure we have appropriate IDs for any new tickets that get created. Coming back into our form, we can reorder things a little bit, probably want to have the title and then the description, and then we can update the status, priority, assignee, and attachments, something like this. If we wanted to really play around with this, we can add sections to our forms um, and then organize our uh, form elements within the sections. We can set them to be columns. Um, but again, in the interest of keeping things quick and clean here, no sections. Ticket title is fine as a regular text entry. The description, I want to change it to a text area instead of a text input, which gives me a larger area, indicates to my user they can write some more in there. For the status, we wanna have a range of options. So we're gonna switch from the user input to the multiple choice and define each of these manually. In a more complicated workflow, we might instead have an object type that represents all of the valid statuses within uh, our state machine. You know, we might have one object per target status, and then we could use that to be a little bit more dynamic in terms of what are the available statuses and, and how do we control which ones are available. Um, that would use this option to get them from an object set. But for us, again, um, we just have a handful of statuses we want, backlog, active, complete, and we'll do one for, you know, descoped, fine. Our priority, uh, we wanna do a constraint here. So since this is a numeric uh, type, an integer type, we're gonna set a minimum and a maximum. Uh, we'll set this to be static of 10 inclusive. You know, we could also make these dynamic based on other uh, parameters that are entered, or if you have an object parameter that's added, we could use properties of that object parameter. Um, we'll see how to do that in the comment creation action. And attachments, fine. The only thing I'll change here, I'm gonna make the attachments optional. So right now it's required, we'll change it to optional and that means you don't have to attach a file, right? But we do have to set the status, priority, assignee, description, and title. Okay, that looks good for our creation of a new ticket. Um, the next action that we need is our action to update the uh, status or the assignee. So let's create a new um, update. We'll just call this the update ticket, right? Because we're going to update a couple of different things or it's going to be possible to update it a couple of different things. So if we change objects, instead of adding, this time we're going to modify our ticket. And we want to modify, what we want to let people modify the assignee and the status and maybe uh, uh, edit the description as well. Sure, we'll, we'll say you can't edit the title. You, well, yeah, fine. We can say you can edit the title, description, status, and assignee. Um, <laughs> we'll create this. Again, uh, it, it's, a little, it's a little contrived what I'm adding here and not adding here to let you update. Um, you know, you might want to let them update everything. You might want to make 
a, a set of different actions, you know, a different action to update the description compared to update the status. That'll often depend on the business logic that you need to create for your workflow, right? Like if updating the status, you know, well, it has certain validations, I can only change the status if these other conditions are met, then it would probably make sense to have a dedicated update status action um, because updating the description might have a different set of, um, of requirements. Maybe you can only update the description if you're the assignee or something like that. Um, we'll, we'll look at that in just a second, actually. Uh, but here, we'll just say, look, we've set this rule. There are four things that you can update when you do the, uh, the update. All of these are going to be user entered. Um, the, we're going to make all of these optional, actually, so that you can uh, change them. The assignee, oh, I think I forgot to change this in the create ticket. The assignee needs to be a user input. Um, this is going to change us to a drop down um, that'll show us, for example, all of the the users. We can search them by by their username or email and um, choose them. What'll get stored underneath is the multipass ID, right? And then we'll be able to render that everywhere as the the right user. Um, what else do we need to change? We need to change the status back to our multiple choice. We want to have the same options. We're not doing any. Um, Overrides. So these overrides up here are how we would change, you know, if I'm in the backlog status, the only available option is to go into the active status or the uh, descoped status. That's that kind of logic you would do here in the overrides configuration. Um, but I'm not going to implement any of that. Again, just want to keep this pretty straightforward. And let you move from any status to any other status. So our statuses were backlog, active, complete, and descoped. And we wanted to change the description over to a text area and the ticket title is at the top. So we actually can we actually can leave all of these as required. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and do that. That's not what we want. We leave these all as required, but we'll see when we set up an edit action, they all have a default value automatically turned on, right? So they're automatically using an object parameter property, the current assignee value from the ticket, right? You can see our form has a ticket parameter at the top, and, and then all of these. Uh, title, assignee, status, description are going to kind of inherit from this ticket the default value that they should use. So we can leave these as required because they will contain the default value um, and the user will kind of see the description here populated by whatever the current description is. Okay, and our final... Uh, oh, one thing I do want to add here before I go away, let, let's look at these last two options. Um, so let's say right now the security and submissions criteria is just that the current user is me in this external dev relations account. But let's go one step further and say that the, this, the, the condition is actually that uh, I'm the assignee, right? That the current user is the assignee to that ticket, All right? So we can say uh, based on the current user, the current user ID, user ID is a parameter from the ticket that matches assignee, right? So this now reads the current user is the ticket ID. And we could do all kinds of things here. We can add conditions, we can add logical operators. Um, these can be based on attributes of the user, right? Is the user in the appropriate group? Or under this condition, is the user in the appropriate group? Um, and those conditions can be things that are based on you know, values that have been entered into the form, but also property values of any of the object parameters that are added to the form. Um, so you can get quite uh, expressive in terms of defining these um, validation criteria, these submission criteria. And here I can just say um, modifying uh, only the assignee can modify 
the ticket. All right, and then maybe later on we, we add another edit that is an admin edit uh, that has a different validation, or maybe we just add a logical operator here that says, you know, all the, if the current user is the assignee or the current user is part of an admin group, and then that admin group can, you know, go in here and use any of the actions. And then the other piece I'll turn on here, it would be really nice if for each ticket, we could see, you know, not just the comments over time, but we could actually see the history, uh, you know, what's the path that it's taken through its statuses? How long did it spend in each status before it transitioned? Um, this is gonna be critical if we want to learn from the data that we're capturing here, not just accomplish the first order, you know, ticket management workflow. We also want to be able to do a meta analysis and look at how long it's taking for this process and, and, and kind of identify um, choke points or, or places where um, things go off the rails. And an easy way to do that is we can turn on logging for our updates. And here, what we're gonna do is it's gonna automatically create a new object type that um, every time this action gets executed, we're gonna create a new object. Uh, and that object is gonna, by default, have the action details. Uh, it's also gonna have the current timestamp and the user and which action uh, type um, was being undertaken. But then we can also log values off of the ticket itself. So here we wanna log the things that are potentially being changed, right? The title, the assignee, the priority, and the status. And we need to, just like we did for the write back data set, this time we're actually gonna generate the input data set and the output data set because we know that this is gonna be completely in empty. So I'm just gonna call this uh, the update ticket schema. So this is our backing data set. And then we're also gonna create the new output data set. following the same naming convention as everything else. Great. So now every time this status change action happens, we will have the log object created and then we can use that data also in our ticket object view, right? This is gonna have by default a link type to the ticket itself. Uh, so we can do a search around, get back all of the logs related to the ticket that we're looking at and use that to display the ticket history directly in our object view. So we can kind of see that timeline of what's changed. Awesome. Okay, so our last our last action type to create before we can dive into building interfaces is adding a comment. So one more time through our little editor, this time we're gonna add the comment object type. Uh, we need to set all of these properties in case we want to add them through our API later on. Rules, everything's good here. We wanna set the created by to the current user and the creation time to the current time. This means our form is gonna be nice and simple. Uh, we are gonna take in the ticket that we want. Uh, we actually don't need the ticket ID. Sorry, that I should have set here on the rules the ticket ID is set to an object parameter property, right? Because we're getting that ticket, uh, the associated ticket as a form parameter, and then we can grab the ticket ID off of it. So this is the pattern if you need to set up, you know, I'm creating a new thing and it needs a foreign key to another thing. Well, I just pass in that target object as an element in my form, and then I can grab any of the properties I need off it, including the um, primary key to set as the foreign key on my comment object. Here uh, we need to add our type class again, actions generate underscore UUID. Now I can see, great, I'm getting a unique ID for my ID property. I can hide that away. And so the only thing that the user actually sees in this form is what ticket should I leave a comment for, 
And we're gonna see as soon as we start putting our interfaces together, we're always gonna set this automatically. So the user's not gonna have to choose this. It's gonna be set based on the context of what they're looking at. So they're really just gonna get this text area. And, and what we'll see in practice is we're actually never gonna show them this form, um, at least inside the applications and views that we've configured. We're gonna abstract this completely away and they'll just see a text box in the user interface they're working with and they can add a comment there. Okay, cool. Let's review all of our changes because I think we have everything we need. So up here in our edit, history, we've been uh, keeping track of all the changes we've made. We haven't saved anything. The object ontology management application kind of lets you build up a working state. Um, and we can see we created our ticket object type. We created our comment object type. We created our log object type that's keeping track of our updates to the tickets. We set up a couple of relations. We set up a link between the comment and the ticket object type. We have a link between the logs and the ticket, and then we have our actions. We create ticket, update ticket, add comment, and this was left over from last time, so I deleted a delete comment. Now, if we decide we wanna have the ability to delete comments later on, I'll come back and fix that off. I need to take care of these conflicts over here. Um, this is saying, yes, I want to actually delete that um, action. Cool, successfully fetched latest, Everything looks good here, and we'll save our changes. Now that we have our changes saved to the ontology, we can get started building our interfaces, but it's gonna be much easier to build those interfaces if we actually have a little bit of notional data to work with. And we can create those without actually putting anything custom together. We can just go to Object Explorer and we'll have access to the actions that we've configured from there as well. So if I open up the ticket object in Object Explorer, well, we don't have any results yet, that's not unexpected, but I can use my create ticket action. So here is a ticket for um, the boundary developer desk side. building a ticket management tool. Uh, cool. Uh, <laughs> make a video showing how to use objects and actions to manage ticket-based workflows. Our status is active. I'm working on it now. Uh, well, oh, must be greater than zero. Got to go up this way, high priority. We're gonna assign this. Oh, I forgot, right, here's where I, I forgot to change my assignee over to uh, the actual dropdown like I did in the in the comment. Um, so, well, we should probably fix that. And come back to our properties, grab our assignee, change it, oh, it's here, it's fine. I've got the right multipass formatting there. I need to go back to the action for creating a ticket and my form and the assignee and say that this is a user. Great. Now I've got a drop down. I can save these changes. Cool. With our form element updated, now I can come back to my Exploration overview, I'll need to reload so that I grab the latest version of the ontology. And now when I go through my action, we'll see, great, my assignee is a selection now. So this was our developer desk side ticket management. Our description is uh, demonstrate building a ticket management tool with objects and actions. Status was active, priority was eight. Assignee is now me, and we don't have an attachment at the moment. 
after applying that change, we can see we've got our new developer desk side ticket. If I come over here to results and like choose this thing, we can also see, hey, we've got an object view, an object view that is not very interesting at all. <laughs> I can come over here to the properties and see the, uh, the things that I've added in, including uh, this, you know, description, whereas it's a long text, you know, it gets broken out over here. But we can do a lot better than this. So let's uh, go in and work on this object view for our, um, uh, oh, I, well, we'll go ahead and do this. We'll, we'll go ahead and do something else as well while we're here, while we're adding stuff. Let's go ahead and add a comment, um, you know, in progress, recording. Now we'll definitely need some editing. Right, and you could see how it automatically knew that action was taken in the context. So, you know, again, if I look at this over here, I now have, you know, a comment in my comments tab. Again, none of this is very usable right now. I mean, like, yes, technically I could look through here and see all of the, the information. Um, and I could, you know, go in here. I could also, you know, update the ticket and change the, the status, um, you know, more description, submit these things, right? I, all of this is actually kind of workable without any custom UI building. Um, you know, I, I, now I can see, I also have this update log that was created where I can see, you know, I, I changed the, the description. I have that kind of history of, you know, who did it, um, all of that. I have a comment, I've got the properties. But let's, let's look at how we can collapse all of this information down and make a really nice view for our, uh, our, our comment now that we have a little bit of data to play with. So there's a bunch of different ways I could come into the object view editor. Uh, I'm gonna do it here kind of from the front end side. So I'm gonna open up my object view. So now I'm just looking at this one ticket that I created. And under my advanced options, I can edit this object view. Now I'm inside the object view editor and I'm actually gonna pretty quickly get out of the object view editor because I wanna build my interface, not here with the kind of widgets that are directly in the object view editor. I wanna go and use workshop because I think workshop is a lot more flexible and robust. Uh, it's a lot easier to keep track of what's going on. So I'm actually just gonna get rid of all of these default tabs delete them all out of here. I'm gonna add a workshop module tab, a new module. I'm gonna stick this module into my uh, folder over here. We're gonna call this the ticket object view. Great. And now I've got a little bit to tidy up on my uh, object view editor before I go into workshop. So I just wanna you know, change the name of this tab. So this is just gonna be overview. It's actually gonna get hidden if I only have a single tab. I'll actually you know, not have this whole tab bar. Um, anything else that I care about here? If I wanted to control who could see the different tabs, I can control that here. But really all I care about now is hopping in and editing this module, right? So I'm leaving behind the object view editor and now I'm inside workshop. Um, and I'm going to, again, I'm going to start by just getting rid of some things. Um, I don't, well, we can, we can leave this. Maybe we can just clean up the properties a little bit. Um, things I don't, you know, I don't need to see the ticket title or the ticket ID. Um, we might want to break out the description into a, uh, into another section that only has, you know, one column so that it has, uh, oh, one column like that. Um, anyway, we'll play with all this. I think I have some other ideas about what we wanna do. But the first thing I wanna bring in actually, because I think it's the most interesting part of this is how to handle the comments. Um, Cause that's gonna be, that's gonna be kind of interesting. Um, I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna put a new section on the right hand side. I'm gonna make a panel that is collapsible and say, you know, 500 wide, or maybe I'll maybe make it flexible so that it takes up, you know, half the area when it's open. Um, we're gonna call this comments. Um, and 
I wanna display the comments in here and have an easy place for the user to type in uh, a new comment and submit it. Um, so I think we'll need a row-based layout because I wanna have a section down here. Let's see, let's make this a toolbar that's gonna to have our submission. So if we, if we set the toolbar layout and set the auto height, we get this nice toolbar. This guy is gonna be an absolute height. This guy is gonna flex. All right, so now I've got some pieces going on here, right? Because what I wanna do is inside of here, I wanna put my text input, right? Um, it is gonna be a text area of whatever, of this height. This is gonna be, you know, enter new comment here. And then I'm gonna put all of the comments up here, right? And, and then down here, I'm gonna add a button to, you know, uh, submit comment. Um, cool. So now I just need to get and display the current comments. Uh, I actually think a nice way to display the comment history is in a object list, right? So what do we want to show in our object list? Um, well, we wanna show comments that are related to the current ticket. So how do we get those? We need to define an object set variable, right? Uh, and by default, we get this nice variable uh, that is the current object displayed in the object view. Um, that comes for free, right? It's set up uh, whenever we go from object view and create our new workshop module. So I can create a new object set variable. We'll call this uh, comments. We're gonna start from the current object displayed in the object view and search around for any comments, right? And so here we've already got one comment. Awesome. Uh, and now we can kind of tweak how that's displayed because this obviously is meaningless. We don't want to show that to the user. So what properties do we want to add? Well, I want to show primarily the comment text. Okay. And then I also want to have the uh, created by, right? And this is nice. So now we can see this nice formatting uh, that comes through, right? It, it makes it very clear who this user is. You get that hover. And then I also want to have the creation time. And now you can see the that relative time formatting, right? This comment was six minutes ago. Okay, so we can get rid of the title. We don't care about that. Um, this is a nice little trick. You can actually just remove these headers, right? So it's actually really clear what each of these things is without a header, right? It's really clear this is my text, this is who left it, and this is the time. Um, and if I want to default sort this, I'll sort it by creation time so that the, well, it depends on how you want it. Do you want the most recent comment first or do you want the oldest comment first? We only have one right now. So that's all we've got to show. Um, but great, let's wire up now our entering of a new comment, right? So when we added this text input, it automatically created for us this new string variable, right? And so I'm just gonna rename this so I keep track of what it is. This is a string. This is our new comment text input, right? Whatever, whatever value is here corresponds to what value is in this input. So if I wanted to give it a default, I could also you know, set that value. Um, or if I change this, you can see the current value here is changing, right? So this is my next comment still recording the video. Cool. And we can see, right, current value here. So what I need now is to come over to my button group because this is where I configure my actions. So I, I set this up just, you know, displaying it first. It doesn't do anything right now, right? I can click on this, it doesn't do anything. I haven't set any on-click configuration, right? So I'm gonna change this from an event to an action because what I wanna happen is to execute an action. Uh, select our action. We're gonna find our uh, add comment with our associated ticket. And now I can set some parameter defaults. So for example, our ticket 
is the current object displayed in the object view. And when we set a default, we get some options here. So I can actually, you know, well, I'll leave it disabled for now um, so that we can see. And then later on, you know, we can hide it. Um, well, actually, we're going to hide the whole thing. So you won't see it. I'll show you this before I hide the whole thing. Um, and then here for the comment text, we can grab this string variable, right? We can also disable that. So with those two disabled, when I click on my submit comment, I see the form, but I can't change anything, right? It's going to submit the comment text for my text input, and it's going to submit the current ticket, and I can submit this, right? And when I submit this change, um, we're going to see, right? Great, awesome. So we got four seconds ago, our new comment shows up. A couple of housekeeping things then. We don't actually need to show the user that form. We don't need for them to double confirm. Um, so we can go over here and in our display options, we can hide this form and apply immediately if valid. So this means if there's no parameters that the user needs to enter into the form because we've templated them all, and none of them are set to visible, which means they could change them. Then uh, with this toggle, when we click the submit button, we'll now no longer need to um, update uh, or take that second action. So let's just, uh, you know, here's one more comment still configuring the commenting interface. But now, my change is applied automatically, right? There's no intermediate pop-up and it comes through in the comment history automatically. The last thing that would be nice here is if this variable, if this, you know, um, reset itself, right? If this, I don't need my old text in here. I want this to clear out after I leave my comment. We can set that up again with a, a follow-on event based on our action, right? So whenever we have an action configured with a button group, down at the bottom, we have this ability to configure a follow-on event. So on successful action submit, add an event, and we're going to reset our string variable, right? Reset new comment text input value. Um, and I probably should also have this not have a default value of whatever random string, we'll just leave that blank. So now I can leave one more, uh, a final comment, but not actually to demonstrate resetting variables. So now when I submit this, we automatically add it. We also see my variable was cleared out and my comment still came in here at the top. Um, all looking pretty good at the at the moment. Um, and we can have our comments hidden out of the way. Uh, we can bring them out um, and show them alongside. And so maybe I'll say actually we'll, we'll default this section to open initially, right? So when the page loads, we actually want the comments showing. Um, and maybe I actually like to replace these with an object uh, title, which will automatically show, okay, it doesn't contain a single item, it contains all our comments, great. So now we get a little, you know, we get the icon and we get um, everything going on there and this, this opens out for free. Um, we can leave that open like this. Uh, but if we want to, we can collapse this out of the way and and you can see the main the main body over here um, and we may just again we don't need to do a ton here we could go further into building out um, all of our all of our pieces one thing i do want to do is pull out our description and put it into a um, put it into another um, into a markdown widget I like using the markdown widget for long text, even if I don't actually have markdown in the text. Um, to use this, I need to create a new object property string variable. So I'm gonna grab the description string, description string off of, not off of comments, Oop, clear that off, off of the current object. I want its description. 
All right, and this just, you know, puts it into a nice, a nice place here. I probably don't need to see, you know, created. I care about the current assignee. Um, let's make this into, you know, two columns. Um, we can have the assignee there and let's keep them kind of ordered. So we'll put the status and priority on the left, on the right, let's try to do that. And so we'll put the status there and then the creation time and the priority. And then we don't need to show the attachments. We'll, we'll wanna show the attachments in like a separate media preview. Um, so this gives us kind of a tidy little, um, a tidy little view into the current state. Maybe we'll put the, maybe we'll put the description at the top because that's the, we can just move this up uh, and we'll set this display to flex. So that gets rid of our little extra thing. So this is very, this is very neat and tidy um, status priority. Okay, save and publish. Once we've saved and published our initial object view here, obviously a lot more we can come back. We didn't add in anything with our log of the change history and we didn't add in anything with the attachments yet. We'll see how we do timing wise. But once we've saved and published this, we can come back to our uh, object explorer, uh, our object view editor, right? And we also need to save and publish here because we've, we've created a new uh, version of this workshop app. So, you know, if we, if we refresh this view, uh, we should now see, um, we'll, we'll, we'll view our changes. We wanna keep the changes that we were working on, but now we can see uh, within our object view, you know, we've got this nice, I can see my comments, I can see my ticket, I can hide these out of the way, focus on my ticket. I also have my actions, you know, to add a comment or update the ticket available here in the object view. Um, but I like this at the object view level so I can save and publish this as well, right? And now going forwards, unless I wanna, you know, come in here and like add a new tab uh, or make some other configuration at the object view level, I can just stick to making changes here within my workshop module. Right. And so maybe even someone else in my organization might come and build some other tab with its own workshop module and they can manage that section and I can manage mine and everybody can have, you know, permissions to only edit the, the workshop modules that are associated with, you know, their particular needs, but they can all live here under the same object view. That's one nice idea. Cool. So now we've got a, an object view that's pretty functional. It lets me you know, take my update ticket action, right? If I need to change things, it lets me add a new comment directly in line and I can see my comment history. Let's look at putting together our application so that we can manage multiple tickets. So this time we're not going to build within the context of an object view, we're just gonna build a standalone workshop application. So we'll come back to our folder and this time just create a new workshop app. We'll call this our ticket Kanban. Uh, and we'll make this one start from scratch. So when I'm starting a, a new workshop module, oh, except I created you a slate app. Uh, we don't really wanna create a slate app. Talk about slate some other time. Goodbye, go away, go away, go to trash. New, not application, a new module, there we go. This is gonna be much quicker. It would take me a good bit longer to build this in Slate. Uh, that's why I like Workshop. Kanban ticket tool. Okay. When I'm building something like this, I wanna start thinking about my layout first uh, before I start putting widgets in or, or wiring up variables, just, just to kind of know what I'm building towards. And, and um, Workshop is nice for this. So what I'm thinking here is I want a, a panel-based layout. Um, maybe I want a panel for each of my um, main uh, statuses, right? So I'm going to have a backlog and then a, um, a backlog and then active and then complete. And then maybe I want a, um, I actually want to put the de-scoped, um, I'll just make it so that you can kind of uh, jump out and view all of the, the de-scoped ones 
easily, right? We don't we won't necessarily put them in this UI, um, but we'll show how you can just point users directly to the descoped ones. So this will be this will be pretty straightforward then. Um, let's keep it here. Three panels. Uh, that was less layout than I thought I would need to do. Um, we'll start by giving ourselves a, a title. Um, that's maybe a, a good starting point. Uh, this is our app title. Uh, this is our ticket Kanban. Okay. And ticket Kanban. Okay. Um, the first thing we need to do is get all of our tickets, right? So to bring in data, we use variables. We'll use an object set definition here uh, for all tickets. And I just want to grab the ticket object type. So I only have one right now. We'll create a few more in just a second so we have something else to see. Um, but that's all of them. And then we want to start breaking them down into their different statuses, right? Because I want to have an object set that has, for example, my active tickets, right? Okay, so I'm going to start from all tickets. I'm going to filter on the status property uh, where it's active. Um, Cool, and I'm actually just gonna do one little thing here for each of these um, statuses, because I'm gonna reuse this in a few places. Um, I'm just gonna create a variable that holds that value and makes it easy to refer to it and later if I need to, to change it. So this is my active status and the value is active. And then over here, rather than just typing in hard coding active, um, I'm actually gonna choose that active status variable. This is just a little foresight, a little planning, um, so that later on I can also use that variable in um, you know, a filter as a default value or something like that. Um, cool, okay, so we've got our active status tickets here, and then maybe we wanna say this is, this is gonna be our active ticket section. Um, again, I like to use the uh, object title instead of you know just typing that in. So here's our active tickets. It's, I want to see the list. I want to override this and make it say active, right? Um, and there's some different things we could do here. We could go further, we could play around with this. We could, sometimes I use a metric card for these because I want to make a different color, you know, for the active versus the backlog versus the complete. Um, I think in this simple example, I'll just show how to how to do this. Well, maybe, maybe we'll do it on one of the other sections. We'll see if we care to do all of these. Um, and then now I just want to add my object list here of the active tickets, right? And I, I can choose um, what I want to show, maybe the status and the assignee are things that I want in here. And we could, you know, it depends on your workflow. Do you want to actually show all of the description inside of here? We can do the same kind of thing that we did with the, the comments flow where we really don't actually, well, I guess we don't need to show the status because we we're in a status category. Um, we can leave off the assignee. Uh, and maybe we want to order these by priority, even if we don't necessarily show the priority um, on the, you know, on the display here. Okay, and then maybe maybe it's a lot to have the um, the logo and then, you know, the, the icon and then all these other icons. We can turn off, maybe we'll turn off the icon here, right? So then it's just active. We got our developer desk side ticket management. Um, so we want a shortcut here to update the status of whatever we're looking at. Um, you know, whatever we have selected so that we could say, you know, move it over to the next section, right? This section is gonna be our, um, our completed. And uh, so if we wanted to do that, let's add a bunch of different places. You know, again, your layout, your preferences, but here I'm just gonna put a button group and I'm not even gonna use any text. I'm just gonna put in the, you know, edit icon here and maybe make it green. And then I like to make them, uh, that's a little bit heavy there. Um, so I'll make this kind of a minimal green button, right? Uh, so I can choose choose one of these, click on this, and then I wanna add my action to update 
the ticket, right? Update ticket. Here's my update ticket. Great. Um, some display defaults. I want to set the ticket default to the active object from my list, right? I'd probably go through and rename these so they're a little bit more clear, but um, I can tell by highlighting, you know, this is the one that I want. Object list one, active object. Disable that. And then uh, all the other ones I want to leave um, in their default values. So now, you know, now when I when I click here, it's going to open up my ticket update and I could change the status, for example, to complete, uh, jumping the gun a little bit. It's going to leave, obviously, this active area. And uh, so we oh, need, to, need to set a couple of things over here. My object set title. I want to show this even when the object set is empty. Yes, this requires telling it that this is a ticket object type. And now it shows active even though the count is empty. Um, and we want to do the same thing that we did over here uh, so we can have our complete ones. Right, so static string, this is our complete value. Our value is complete. And our object set of tickets complete starts from all of our tickets and filters on the status property where the status is our complete value. Great. And now, you know, now look, I'm just duplicating the exact same thing that I did before, adding a title this time for our complete. Contains no yes when it's empty. Turn on the ticket and override this to complete. Turn off the icon, right? So that's now our header. And here I'm just gonna actually copy and paste, right? Control C, Control V. Now I have this widget in my unused widget object list two, it's got the same configuration, and I just want to show the complete tickets instead, right? So now I've got, uh, I've got our, um, our setup, and you could see, you know, I moved something from active over into complete um, by, and here, uh, let's see, let's see, my button group is hidden here because I don't actually have um, the, uh, any ticket selected. Um, so that's actually kind of fine. I, I'll leave it so that it hides. Um, and we could, you know, take that same button group, copy, paste it, and add it. You know, I would just kind of from a UI perspective, add that um, for for each one, right? So that was button group two. Um, the reason that, you know, here, button state if invalid, it disabled. That's what I'd want to do. Maybe I'll just do that for the purposes of showing you what's going on, right? So the, the button's still there. You can only, you know, uh, the reason it's it's not happy is actually because it needs a object added to it. So here now we have the object two active object, right? These get automatically created when you add the object list, right? And now, you know, now I can edit this one from its complete form, right? Cool. Um, we might probably want to button up here to. Uh, add a new ticket, right? We want we want to create a new um, a new ticket overall. So let's see, let's say like add new ticket. Uh, our intent is maybe primary here. Uh, left icon, okay, the add button action. This is our create ticket. This one. Yes, this one. Yes, looks great. That's our add new ticket button. So now, yep, now I can add a new ticket and put it, for example, in the, the backlog. So another video that I'm planning to make soon is around uh, workshop um, layouts and design best practices. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take a, um, unorganized, maybe a nice way to say it, organized workshop app and refactor into uh, streamlined uh, UX driven app. Fine. 
Uh, we'll put this one in the backlog and I don't know, plan on working it next week. Assign this to myself, right? So now we just need the same setup that we have over here for our backlog, right? So one more round of a static string variable. This is our backlog status backlog and one more object set variable that holds on to our tickets that are in the backlog status, starting from all of our tickets, filtering on status using the backlog status that we just created. Great. And again, we can copy and paste our title to put it over here. Change this to backlog and update this to our backlog tickets. Great, everything else stays the same. Get rid of the section header. Same thing here, copy and paste, add in object list three. Update this to point at our backlog. And finally, we might as well put our edit button over here in the same place. Button group four, again, we just wanna make sure that we're updating the default active object, right? And so this is now gonna be the object list three active object. You can go back through and update all these names. I think that's a good practice. I'm just skipping through it in the interest of time. But now, you know, if I, if I said, okay, actually I'm ready to, to start working at this and I'm gonna move it into the active status, uh, I can update it here. It'll pop over here into, into the active board on my, on my kind of Kanban. And then maybe, maybe the last thing we wanted to do here is um, you know, a, a, a link to view the descoped, um, the descoped, uh, tickets. And, and this is a, this is a nice thing you can do just to show that you don't have to rebuild everything here inside of workshop. Uh, we can also use object Explorer and the other object layer tools. Um, so I'll add one more button group, because even if I want to make a link, I basically use a button group. <laughs> um, We'll call this uh, view descoped. Um, and maybe I'm just gonna leave this one kind of as a, a minimal, um, I don't know, maybe we'll make it minimal and blue. So it looks kind of like a, looks kind of like a link there. View descoped, probably should get an icon. Um, I don't know, maybe we can, I, oh no, we should use the, um, the open, uh, what do we actually use? This up and right arrow. There we go. That kind of indicates, right? You're gonna leave. You're gonna leave this interface, right? We're gonna take you somewhere else. View descoped uh, tickets. So here, instead of using an action, we're just gonna use an event. We're gonna use an event to open Object Explorer, and we can give it an object set variable to use. So again, I'm gonna shortcut it this time. Maybe it would be good to do uh, the same pattern with a string variable, but I want to finish this off. Objects, descoped, starting from all tickets, filter on a property, status is descoped. We don't have any at the moment. Uh, so we'll set this over to our descoped tickets. Um, maybe I'll move this one into descoped status just to demonstrate. Now it doesn't show up here, go away out of my active, but if I click on view descope tickets, it's gonna take me out of workshop into object explorer and show me, hey, here's your one descoped. We could default this to land, for example, on the, the results tab. Um, we could add in a few of these other, you know, things like, you know, who was the assignee, um, what was its priority and description, Save this over here on our custom layouts. We could save the current view as, you know, at least for me, if I was a, an actual builder, if I was the one who kind of owned this whole project, I could actually set this so that everybody would see this, this layout. This is our ticket object explorer default, right? Um, but again, uh, you can set this up so that now when any, you know, when anyone lands, they'll, they'll automatically land in the um, 
Ah, there we go, sorry, in the results view. You also want to set this initial perspective, right, to the results view. So now, you know, now if we open this up, it's going to take us right here to the results view rather than the explore view. Um, it just depends, it just depends completely on, on what you want. In the explore view, if you're setting it up here, you can also, you know, choose exactly which of these visualizations. Again, if you have an object type that has actual data in it as opposed to, um, uh, this where we where we kind of actually just care about each individual one and right now and I can still here bring up my object view right this is still nice right I can I can still see all of this I can add my comments um, interact with the object view that's now you know nice and clean um, directly you know within this uh, this descope view right so if I wanted to if I want to for example take this back out and you know, put it back into active status. We could change this um, directly. We're going to see it leaves here. Um, and when I come back into my Kanban, I'll you know, save and publish this so we can actually view this application and uh, give it a quick reload so that we get our active here. So this is one thing to know is that you won't get you won't get push notifications within your your Kanban. You can turn on um, there's some different options to kind of set some some auto refresh, something that we'll be working on, um, so that you know if people are changing these statuses from other places and I'm actively looking at this, that that things would that things would update. Um, but for now, you know everybody everybody can use this uh, this app, and it will at least you know if I go in here and edit this, if I go in here and try to edit this, and someone else has changed it somewhere else, I will get a I will get a prompt that says, hey, you actually need to update, you need to refresh. Um, before making edits because because there's been a change since this object was last loaded. One last piece I want to add here is the ability to to view the ticket details and make a comment directly within our app without leaving the the context of of where we're at. So a few steps here. The first thing is a layout step. So we want to add a new drawer on the right to show our object view. Right, so this this in here is going to use. We're just going to reuse the object view that we already have. And so, for example, we could set this to just look at you know what's the active object from two. Right, and this, this is great. Now, now I mean it's a little cramped, so we should you know take this drawer and make it uh, the large size. Right, so now there's room. Right, I can see the ticket, the status properties, the comments that have come in. Um, and I could add and submit a new comment. So, so we'll just call this our, you know, ticket details. Uh, and this drawer is our ticket details drawer. Uh, this was some other drawer. Let's get rid of that one. Okay, so now we need a way to open these up, and we want to be able to open it up for any of the tickets that we've clicked on. You know, similar to how we have the edit set up, but we also have a problem that we have three different active state widgets, um, you know, because we have these three different lists. So so how do we do this? Um, well, again, a, a bunch of different patterns, but one that I'm gonna go with here is to add a view button that's associated with each of these, uh, each of these lists. I could also just have like a global view button um, but that gets a little trickier. So let's just do that. So I'm gonna change this over from a uh, an inline to a two-part button. I'm gonna put my uh, update ticket here at the top, because that's the thing that I think is gonna be most often. And unfortunately, it means I just need to, to reconfigure it, but it's, it's actually super quick um, action. So it was update ticket, update ticket, and then the only thing I needed to set is what the default ticket here is going to be, and it's our object list three active object, right? You can see it's getting highlighted. Nice. Um, so that that now works as my update button. I want to disable that ticket. There we go. And then this is no longer an action. Um, I'm going to make an event. So this pattern here is a little bit interesting because what we're going to do is uh, is twofold. Um, so this event is simply going to open the ticket details 
drawer, right? So now I've got, oh, it probably shouldn't look like an edit. We should look like, how about a, uh, a an eye maybe for details and uh, view details. So now, now I've got a drop down here, view details. Let's just make it none, like a plain link to view to the details. And that'll open up this. But now we, now we need to do a better job of determining what object to display, right? We don't wanna just, because if we try to choose, right, you know, if I'm gonna have the same button in each of these other sections, that gets a little tricky. So now I wanna have a single variable and we're just gonna reuse one because right now we don't have any multi-select going on. Um, I'm just gonna reuse one that's coming from one of my object lists because I need this static value type. And the only way you can get a static value type is as an output from an object list or an object table. Um, but then we can repurpose it. So what I'm gonna, I'm gonna repurpose this as a singleton. This is the object to display in object view, right? Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this based on the last thing the user clicked on, right? So over here in each of my object lists, I've got this ability to set an event on object select. So now whenever the user selects something in the backlog, I'm gonna set the, I don't wanna reset it, sorry. I'm gonna use the set variable value event. The source variable is the active object, right? The one that they just, sorry, <laughs> wrong order of operations here. We actually don't want to do this based on, oh yeah, yeah, no, this is exactly right. Sorry, the source variable is, nope, nope. <laughs> Definitely not right. Okay, let's start this over again. Um, don't want to add an event here. Yeah, we want to do it here. We want to do it here. We do want to do it on our view details. Okay. Um, okay, so we, we open, we have add our event uh, to open the details drawer. We also need to add an event to set a variable value. Um, and we actually want to do these in the other order. So first we're going to set a variable value. The source variable is the active object from our relevant list and our target is the object to display in the object views. And then we also want to add in our open ticket details drawer. So now um, when I click on one of these and then click on the view details, we open this up and instead of displaying the object list to active, I want to just use this object to display in the object view. And now it's set, now this variable is set to the, um, the variable, the object that, that is selected in my, in my relevant list. And so the nice thing is here is we can just duplicate this configuration for, for everywhere else. And, and again, I'm just going to, um, delete these other two out. And since I have this one all configured, I'm just gonna copy and paste it. Come here. Button group, copy, paste, and I'll paste it again, right? So um, I've got two versions of it. We'll drop one in to active. And again, my, my goal here is just to go through and change the default ticket that gets passed into things. So I want this one, object list one, active object. Yep. And I need that one for this as well, right? It's the source for object list one, active object, right? It's the one that we want to set as the details. And we'll do it one more time over here to add back in a button group and this one, instead of object list three, it's gonna be our object list two active object, right? We just wanna, you can use the highlighting to double check and make sure that we're choosing the right ones as we go through this, right? And I wanna choose again, object list two active object, right? And open the details drawer. So now, um, now it will, um, and maybe, maybe one last thing I wanna do on all of these is disable the object auto selection. 
because that's just going to mean when the page loads that I don't have something. Uh, it'll be, oh, no, not that one. Sorry. It'll be a little bit more clear um, to the user how these things look. So let's, let's save and publish this and check out our, our kind of finalized app. Um, uh, one thing to change there, right? All of these, all of these uh, reset their, um, their default so that they're uh, hidden. So when I, when I got rid of the active, um, when I got rid of the active selection by default, these uh, went away. Um, so our update ticket Why did that one came back? Oh, there we go. Yep, sorry. Of course, disabled. And we need to do the same thing one more over here. Disabled. Okay. Save and publish and viewer app. So now we've got now we've got kind of this going on. Nothing selected by default. Um, if I grab, you know, workshop layouts and design best practices and view the details, then that's gonna be what's active over here. And I can, you know, uh, still in the backlog, some initial design work completed. All right, maybe update, update that guy and then decide to update it and move it over into, you know, the backlog or something like that. So now we've got, you know, now we've kind of got this whole piece moving around, right? Uh, and I can take this and say, actually, you know, yeah, I'm gonna work on this one uh, as my current one, move it over into active. Um, and if I wanted to hop over and view the Dscope tickets, I can get out of here um, or I can, you know, hang out and work on my details. And you can see, again, we're just showing, we're just showing whichever one I've most recently clicked on. Right. Um, okay. So I think that is going to wrap up, go away. Uh, I think that's going to wrap up our desk side here. Um, hopefully this is a, a good reference example on kind of how to go end to end. We've talked about a whole bunch of different pieces, um, how to create our schema data sets, how to create our new object types and the associated actions and property metadata. And then a good bit here on the UI side, how do we build workshop backed object views? How do we build a, a standalone workshop application? How do we reuse those object views as components within that interface? And then also how do we, you know, hop out of that interface and head over to, you know, our open-ended tool? How do we get people out into exploration mode? You know, from there, you know, you could go into Quiver, um, you could, you know, go into more open-ended kind of, uh, exploration of, of your data that's been created. Okay, um, let us know in the comments below if you like this kind of long form um, developer desk side style video. Um, leave us some feedback on what you'd like to see in future videos. Uh, if you have technical questions, hop over to Stack Overflow. Um, you can ask about workshop or code repositories or ontology configuration over there and we'll get you answers and make sure you check out our new uh, public Foundry documentation. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in there, some things that you may not have seen before, even in the in-platform documentation, if you're already a user, like this solution design content. So thanks for hanging out this afternoon. Um, hope you're enjoying your explorations of Foundry and, and finding this kind of content helpful, and look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now.